episode 9, about the war, and good day again. I hope your day has been filled with classically compelling content and many meaningful memes. I believe that's what it takes to make people happy these days. And now let's see what Hickory is up to. Well, it looks like steel smithing is the newest skill set to have been acquired. Steel's going to make a considerable difference to the level of security achievable, and it'll also improve the grade of weapon that Hickory can manufacture. Not to mention armor. And just to make sure I don't mention it, I'll talk about something else now. Sometimes on quiet nights, Hickory likes to take some pot shot target practice at the moon, just for the heck of it. But most of all, Hickory loves to test fire new weapons. This one is legendary. It's a blunderbuss. But Hickory likes to say, That's me thunder blunder fun gun. Now this episode is going to be one of the longest ones I've done so far. The reason for that is because I'm doing a distinctly different dialogue delivery. And that means that I'll be presenting this episode in the form of a day in the life of Hickory Diamond. So we'll be following Hickory around all day, exactly like I do in every other video that I've made. And I'll be talking about the war because the title said I had to. But as usual, I won't get everything covered because of a multitude of my meaningless mental meanderings that you find so entertainingly annoying. And I do know that you find them entertainingly annoying because I just heard myself say that. And if you'll take note of the in-game day and time, you'll see that it is the night before the day before the night of the third marauding horde. Or in other words, the third horde night is approaching. One of the many duties of the serious survivalist of this game is regular garden attendance. Unfortunately, this version of the game that I'm playing doesn't have fertilizer or the chemistry station, plus some other goodies that came with later versions of the game. But I do have the spawning rate set to maximum, because my view of the game's primary objective is to hunt and kill as many multitudes of the Skark and Skellywags as possible. Because it is the funnest part of the game, and I probably agree with that too. Well now this part of the garden, this is what I call my perimeter garden. I'm planting precious flowers in it, and I call it the perimeter garden because it goes all the way around the building, on one side, along the front, in a nice straight circular line there. Also, something else you have to keep in mind is the garden needs to be positioned a little bit away from the base, otherwise you find you're continually exploding your most reliable source of food. And now there's probably not much left for me to do other than some uninspired utterances on the war, like I promised. So it's a commonly accepted fact that the Seven Days to Die game world was created by some kind of a worldwide nuclear event. That event is widely accepted among the devotees of the game to have been a war. Well, let me just shit in bed and kick it out with me foot then. That's got to be the laziest bumfart attempt of law creation for a game ever manifested, I think. And I've used the word manifested because it's got the word fested in it, which means that anyone who subscribes to that spurious slag aggregate has fested pus for brains. And you'll be happy to hear that it isn't me. It's actually more likely to be you. Ah yes, now it's time for some sweet scavenging bounty. Absolute crap. And holy crap, that's a belching chundamonger. Or a waddle trotter if you prefer. And where is he? He's got to be somewhere around here, gurgling and belching among the bushes. Ah, I see the bloated bilious blob. Let's see if I can get his bounty. That's one good hit. That's two. How did that miss? That's three good hits. Four good hits. Five good hits. Six good hits. Seven good hits. And he's going ballistic. Timing's crucial now. Eight hits. And the kill shot. And that is how it's done. And you'd better have some sweet plunder. Moldy old doe, you're shitting me. I don't know how to feel about that. Pissed off, probably. Well, not much else left to do. I might as well run screaming into the bush. <coughs> oh, hey, look. A fire stick in the bush. What'll they think of next? No bounty? That's worse than that slobbering waddle trotter. 
And it looks like things are going to get a little bit killy here for a while now. But that is what the game's about. I do like to set my battle scenes to music. It tends to set the mood for the situation. This is a light-hearted encounter. There's a lot of skarks, but there's not a lot of danger. Because as you'll see, Hickory is becoming quite adept at using the bow and arrow and avoiding the poundings of the pestilent skarkin. Now I did say earlier that I had the spawning rate set to maximum. So this is a good example of what you can expect to encounter when you venture out and the spawning rate is set to that level. As you will well understand, it makes resource gathering quite a challenge. This was meant to be a clay and timber gathering expedition and as you'll see when I get back to the base, I did successfully gather what I wanted. But it was quite a challenge time-wise. You've always got to be looking over your middle shoulder. There are breaks between each assault which gives you time to do some of the resource gathering. But there are always more of their brethren lurking just on the horizon. Luckily they're not coming thick and fast but they are coming persistently. And they're fairly easy to deal with when they're just one at a time. It's only when you encounter a horde mode onslaught that things start to get intense. Oh, these bloody bobbleheads are impossible to nail down. But then, sometimes you just get lucky. Now, earlier I said this was supposed to be a resource gathering expedition, but I've chosen not to put the resource gathering in this video because I figure that the kill sequences are the more entertaining of the two activities. Plus, the video is longer than usual already, so something had to go. So shoveling and chopping got the chop. Also, this video being a day in the life of Hickory, it represents just over a 24 hour period taking in the day before the third Horde night, right up until the morning ending the event. And I wanted to get as much of a normal day's activities included in the video as possible without being repetitive and boring. Resource gathering, scavenging, plundering and corpse raping of course are all very important activities, but the most essential activity is the upgrading and maintaining of your base. Because the integrity of your base is the difference between safety and squander. And the reason I've used the word squander there, as opposed to peril or danger, is because if your base is compromised and the Skarkin bandits do break in, the first casualty is you. It's not that you're concerned about dying, because you're protected by the S-plasma. But if you haven't established a safe zone in a separate protected area, you will be continually beaten into reciprocal events, only to be reciprocated and beaten again. Any bounty that you've gathered and stored inside your base is likely to become collateral damage as well. And generally speaking, you're in for a wholly objectionable night. So in summation, you've squandered everything for the sake of a little time spent on upgrading and maintaining your base. Now we're nearing the end of this battle scene, so I'll be quiet now, and I'll be back with you after the battle. Well now let's get back to yakking about the war. I suppose the first factor I should cover regarding the war is what was the cause of the war. Well, I don't know what the official story is here, nor do I care very much, but my war had a very clear and definite cause. But before I get into depth talking about the war, there is something else that I feel I need to explain a little better. I have mentioned it before in episode 1 when I gave you a quick explanation about why I'm making these videos. In the scrolling introduction of episode 1, I said, quote, I only have one problem with the game, and that is the crappiness of the official backstory. I'm a little OCD. I need a full and complete rational explanation as to why things are the way they are. But that doesn't exist. So I came to the conclusion that if I were going to continue to play this game, I would have to create my own version of Seven Days to Die lore. End quote. When I play Seven Days to Die, 
I am fully invested in the experience, meaning that I totally and absolutely immerse myself in the experience of my game character. So all the things happening in the game have an inherent imperative to me to make sense and to be believable. I'm not someone who can easily accept the premise of that's game logic or that's just the way the game is. So as I play, that part of my brain that demands that OCD criteria works silently in the background to give me a full and complete rational explanation as to why things are the way they are. And it's from that brain and game interaction that this video series and the story of Hickory Diamond was born. And so if you have any questions about any aspect of the developing law according to Grassy Beans, don't hesitate to ask. I can answer anything. And if I don't have an answer, I'll just make something up. Why not? I made up the whole story from scratch anyway. And anything I can't explain, I'll just tell you, don't be stupid. That's just the way the game is. Which completely solves the problem. For me. Ooh, got one. I was hoping to lure him onto the spikes, but a hysterical exploding of a would-be assailant is always deliriously gratifying. Don't you think? Oh, look at that chunky trotter waddling past. I'm gonna hit him with a poke. Bugger it all, I missed. Damn it, now I'm gonna have to go outside and fuck him in the eye socket. Hang on a minute. Sounds like the spikes are doing my job for me. Yep, I couldn't have fucked him up any better than that myself. Now I can get back to what I was doing. I think I'll put some bombs around outside. I do so enjoy watching explodey things go off. Oh my, the garden looks good. But I'm just going to keep working now while I do some more talking about the war. So, if you were paying attention in episode 6, you'll know what caused the war according to my law. But... For those lazy bum farts who either didn't watch episode 6 or didn't pay attention during the video, I'll say it all again. Nice going bum farts, now I've got to repeat myself like some sort of an old person wearing a mobility scooter for legs. And now this is what episode 6 said caused the war. The moon. It was the moon. So now that I've got that prolonged and entangled explanation out of the way, I can now talk about some of the other things that contributed to the advent of worldwide warmongering among the multitudes. I think I'll start by defining the state of our world as it stands today. Starting with those who are in control. Most people believe that it's the governments that actually have control of things. And although that's not actually true, we'll look there first. There are quite a number of different governing systems in the world today, and that's nothing new. It's always been that way. Every different country embraces a different governmental ministerial approach. And there heralds the curfew. Time to see how many boobies my booby traps have snared. I do like booby traps, and that's because I'm quite fond of boobies. Well, that's one. And there's another. Well, the spikes are working a treat. But nobody seems to be interested in my bombs. And after all that trouble I went to putting them there. Now, oh, but what's this? A couple of squirming skarks are about to trigger a blast. This should be reasonably entertaining. Blast. The bloody bomb didn't blow. Just so close. You're all so stupid. Look what they're doing. It looks like a slow motion stampede of rabid sloths. Well, it's probably time I whipped out me whopping great thunder gun, I think. Ah, oh, the bombs. I missed it. Well, that was fundamentally frustrating. I'm gonna kill someone for that. You. Oh, that's odd. I don't feel any better for that. Maybe if I do it again. And again. That's not working like I thought it would. I think I'll keep right on doing it though. And there's going to be a lot of thundery and explodey noises for a while, so let there be music.
think I need to be closer to the action. I'm heading downstairs. You should come too. Uh-oh. They've erected a hole in my wall. Well, I'm not at all pleased about this erection. So this is what you get. Lost me box of clay. All that clay gathering this morning wasted. This is what I was saying earlier about upgrading and maintaining your base. Now I know where the kill cage needs extra work. Back to more killing now. fixing these holes before some creepy crawly comes skulking in. And what did I just say? It's a slonk. And now I've got to deal with the thing that I just said. Also, I don't know if you've noticed, but how annoying is it that Hickory has a broken leg and hasn't tried to fix it? I'll bet you don't even know when that happened. And now I think it's probably time I engaged the inner crush. I've got to put away me hammer and take out me legendary thumping thunder gun again. And then it's back to the business of infestation extermination.
no, it isn't morning yet, so technically Horde Night isn't over. But I think Horde Night's about over. And I think I'll clamber up the ladder and do some business on the roof that I wouldn't normally do on the ground. Business like, see what's out there. Which is precisely nothing. Or maybe blow something up. Oh dear, that's in my shoe. Well, that'd pluck a suckling pig. What did I just do? I think I've just herniated my left cleavage. This'll fix it. It fixes everything. Especially herniated cleavage. So, now that I'm all unherniated again, let me pick up with the war again. The last statement I made before the curfew was about all the different forms of government. Or to be more precise, I said, every different country embraces a different governmental ministerial approach. And so, to pick up from there, it only takes a quick Bing search to see a comprehensive list of all the different forms of government. And yes, I intentionally didn't mention Lugi as the search engine. I've told you before why I don't like Lugi. But of all the governmental ideologies in force, there is one that's worldwide, regardless of a country's governmental ideals. The power of this governing entity encompasses the entire globe. Now sneaking carefully. Bugger, now I've lacerated my femoral artery. Bleeding profusely is no way to enter your kill cage. And I've left the door open. Go and shut it. Ah, too late. Ah, rude. Yeah, take that. That's what you get for hitting me while I'm bleeding, you twaddle clotted thunder cunt. So many interruptions. Now, what was the last thing I said before that colossal cum curdle clouted me? Ah oh, yes, I think it was about the power of a governing entity that encompasses the entire globe and also transcends the power of any recognised government. It affects everybody. Every living human being is under the rule of its dictatorial influence. And you've known about it for most of your life. It's called money. Money enslaves all who come into contact with it, and particularly those who embrace its ideologies. And if you think you're not enslaved by money, try living without it. Now, I know that it is possible to live without money, but that's not my point. Money carries with it a very specific mental conditioning of scarcity. From what I've seen, money is apparently infected with a psychological virus that embeds within its victim's subconscious a line of programming that states, I need more. It doesn't seem to matter how much money you have, it's never enough. Every person is the same, whether they have seven dollars or seven billion dollars. Everyone always wants more money. And it seems the more money people have, the stronger is their need for more. Oi, idiot face. Yeah, you. Ah, oh, very well done, my precious thunder gun. Now, if I recall, I've got some fixer-upping to do to my outer walls over here in the corner where these wall holes are. The outside can just leak into the inside any time it wants. And that's unacceptable. Iron bars are in order, I think. Just gotta get it positioned just right. Oh, for the love of a soggy washcloth. He's slowly rampaging through the outer wall, just like I worried about a few seconds ago. Now here's how to deal with an on-the-loose slonk, when all you've got for a weapon is a barbed wire cracker bat. It's just that simple and enjoyable. And back to putting the iron bars in. And now, I think I'll endeavour to get a little bit more covered on the programming being perpetrated by that thing called money. It is a fact that money has made you its bitch. You have to have money. The need for it forces you to go to work every day. But then you say, no, I choose to go to work. But then I say, ah, you see, do you see how well enslaved you are? You're not even aware of the fact you actually believe that you are acting according to your own free will. If you truly can choose, then choose to not go to work and just see what happens. 
Money is a very powerful governing force and there are few who are free from its tenacity. Hickory, however, is from a different time. Hickory is free. Salsac. Share and like, subscribe and comment.